Hello there, my friends, and welcome to another episode of Stand Up. It's the Tuesday show. This is the show I'm posting on the 18th of June as we get closer to the longest day of the year. I've got two great guests on the show. Haven't done that in a long time. Congresswoman Jasmine Crockett, and uh, such a great conversation. She's so great, so happy I was able to land the interview with her. And LA Magazine, today's big stuff. Sam Youngman both joined me today. My conversation with Congresswoman begins at about seven and a half minutes after headlines. No sound clips today. Long story. And then Sam Youngman and I start at about 22 minutes in. If you want to skip ahead to the interviews, but I hope you'll stay for the news, which is now dedicated to listener Dan Leaf after his pouring out of, of, of praise and thoughtfulness about how much he loves it. Appreciate your feedback on the conversation with J.L. Covan yesterday and everything else that I'm doing. You can always hang out with us in the Discord on the Discord platform. I love to jump in there and see what everybody's saying, and you can feel a little less alone. If you're feeling alone, that's an easy thing to do these days and has been since I started this podcast. I've learned so much about people and their desire to connect and be a part of our community, any community, and I'm so happy to have you as part of ours. I hope to see you this Thursday night. I'll be hosting a hangout as I do pretty much every Thursday, and we'll go over all of these stories and so much more, or talk about whatever you want to talk about, like this one. Let's get it started right now with your headlines, and I think that it's a pretty big deal that the Surgeon General has decided that there should be warnings for social media. He said that he would push Congress, it needs to be done legislatively, to require a warning label on social media platforms similar to those on tobacco and alcohol products. The labels would advise parents that they could harm teenagers' mental health. He wrote an op-ed in the New York Times, there's no seatbelt for parents to click, no helmet to snap in place, no assurance that trusted experts have investigated and ensured that these platforms are safe for our kids. So you can read his essay there and you can get behind that. Where would they put the label? Because it's just an app on your, most likely your phone. So would, 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 the, would there be an alert that comes up every time you go into the app? I'm not sure exactly how that would work or if it would be effective, but that was big news yesterday. The other big news, lots of it, but that it's it's hot. Early heat waves sweeping the country. The official start of summer, just a couple days away. The longest day of the year is the summer solstice this week. I think that's Thursday, but extreme heat already enveloping much of the country. The heat index, which is a measure of how the temperature feels, hit 100 102 degrees in Cincinnati yesterday. Similarly, sweltering conditions expected to push into my neck of the woods and maybe yours, the Northeast, beginning today and continuing through the weekend. It looks like it's going to be in the 90s and some places are 10 to 20 degrees above where they should be this time of year, according to one meteorologist quoted in the New York Times. Environmental, labor, and health groups filed petition today to push the federal government to declare extreme heat and wildfire smoke as major disasters and uh, there's a lot more about that, obviously, and we're going to see a lot more of that, which is depressing and hard to get around. Speaking of which, the Israeli military said yesterday it paused combat operations during daylight hours near a border crossing in southern Gaza, a new policy that officials said would continue every day until further notice, a pause in combat that should help some aid get through. Aid workers in Gaza said they're cautiously hopeful that the daily pauses, which apply to a seven-mile stretch of road in southern Gaza, would allow them more easily and safely deliver much needed food and supplies, though these same agencies are warning that other restrictions on movement as well as lawlessness has made food distribution real difficult. And in related news, Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu dissolved his war cabinet after the departures of two key members. So keeping an eye on that, let's come back home and take a look at some of the announcements from the Biden administration. And number one, the Biden administration's new policy to clear the way for hundreds of thousands of undocumented immigrants married to U.S. citizens to apply for legal residency, one of the most expansive immigration programs of his presidency, according to two federal sources with knowledge of the plans. Policy shift is a bold move for the Democratic president months before the November elections and a rebuke to congressional Republicans who have ignored nor does call to expand border security and create a path to citizenship for the 11 million undocumented immigrants living in the United States for many decades. Biden will unveil the policies at a celebration at the White House to mark the 12-year anniversary of another executive action taken to aid immigrants when he was vice president. This is back in 2012. President Obama said he would allow undocumented immigrants who arrive in the United States as children 
to apply for work permits, a program that transformed hundreds of thousands of lives for the better. So this is a really good, fair and decent policy. Of course, Republicans are outraged by it. They're also really outraged, as always, by trans people using uh, bathrooms and the Biden administration's new Title IX regulations that expanded protections for LGBTQ students have been temporarily blocked in four states that filed injunctions after a federal judge ruled that the Education Department overstepped its authority in these states. So closely follow what happens with that. Now, here's some good news. In Maryland yesterday, you may have heard the governor, the great Wes Moore, who I used to know and interview and still hope to uh, speak to again at some point. I love Wes Moore. I think he'll probably run for president. He's currently the uh, governor of Maryland. Well, he signed an executive order pardoning more than 175,000 marijuana convictions, the governor's office said. Governor Moore signed the executive order in Annapolis with the state attorney general and in attendance. An estimated 100,000 individuals will be affected by the pardon, the governor's office said in a press call Monday morning morning. And I want to talk more about what that means with somebody who knows there in Maryland and where the uh, progress on similar other states may be, because that is just such an injustice, of course. Uh, how about this? The IRS estimates that it will raise more than $50 billion over the next decade by closing a loophole often exploited by wealthy filers seeking to avoid paying taxes. The loophole allows such taxpayers as well as businesses to move assets between entities in a way that authorities say has no economic purpose. How about that? That's good news. But here's some bad news. It's about the bird flu. The H5N1 virus is now infecting some cats and the occasional dog. I don't like that. We don't need it in mammals. No, thank you. And in trade news, after the EU apparently imposed extra tariffs of up to 38% of China's electric cars, now China's threatening to impose tariffs on European pork imports because that's how trade wars are fought. And those are your headlines. All right. Ran out of time to get the sound clips because I did like four interviews on Monday and I've got two of them for you here right now. So I'm going to let them take over. I'm sorry I don't have your sound bites for you here on a Monday. We'll get back after it tomorrow. But I know you're going to love my conversation with Sam Youngman coming up. And obviously everybody loves Jasmine Crockett, right? She is the congressman representing Texas's 30th district, former public defender, civil rights attorney who's dedicated her life to public service, and she has really become a huge star in the 118th Congress. Of course, she's joined me here on the program before. You've seen her in the Oversight Committee, as well as several others in the House. One of the few black women ever elected to Democratic House leadership. And, well, she's just awesome. Everybody saw her tangling with Marjorie Taylor Greene. Marjorie Taylor Greene, of course, attacking her eyelashes, making saying something about her eyelashes. And then, of course, the clapback, the best clapback back ever in the history of Congress, potentially. Bleach blonde, bad build, butch body, the greatest <laughs> of all time. Let's do it right now with Jasmine Crockett. Congresswoman, welcome back. Thank you so much for talking to me this morning. Absolutely. You are making some really huge moves in Congress and you become a real sought after, I feel like, guest speaker, fundraiser. You were just in Pennsylvania campaigning. Is that what you were doing? <laughs> yeah, absolutely. What is so important that you get out to all these other states other than your own in Texas? Yeah. So everybody knows that Texas is as backwards right now, but you know what? One of the things that I stress while in Philly is that it was for Juneteenth celebration is that our collective freedom runs right through Philly and understanding that our fates are tied. These are the messages that I'm sending when I'm in Detroit, Philly, and any other probably large urban center that really will play a huge role in making sure some of these states that we know can go either way, some of these battleground states, that they understand that it's just that important for me as a Texan. Their state may make the difference between a national abortion ban or not. Their state may make the difference between whether or not Trump is allowed to add another two justices to our court. Yeah. Their states absolutely have power that unfortunately Texas has uh, decided not to harness just yet in making sure that my future and the future of so many that I love is either bright or dark. And that's the message that I'm stressing to them. Well, it's, I think, really important that you're in a place like Philly. You didn't mention Milwaukee, and I want to know, I saw you you touting your friend Gwen Moore's reaction, Congresswoman <laughs> Moore's reaction to uh, the disgraced former president. 
his his comments about Milwaukee. But what do you say about his comments calling Milwaukee terrible, as well as so many other cities in America? Well, that's what he does. So this idea that there's all these black folk that are like, let me go towards Trump. (laughs) Maybe. I don't know. I haven't met him just yet. I think the issue is going to be more so people deciding between the current administration or staying home on the couch because Trump continuously tells us exactly where he is when it comes to people of color. He has consistently had disparaging things to say about cities that have majority minority populations. And that's exactly what he did when he wanted to talk about Minneapolis. We know that he called or he told us to go back to our shithole countries before when he was running his racism is always on full display. And I don't really care how many random bootleg rappers he decides that he's going to parade out. I'm sure he's given them a couple of dollars to come out and pretend as if he's their guy, but it doesn't matter. We see through that. We know better. We know when somebody's playing in our face and that's all that he's doing. And no, I didn't mention Milwaukee because when more definitely is holding it down <laughs> Well done. Uh, in yeah. Milwaukee. <laughs> Yeah, uh, that's awesome. Uh, well, you always are speaking truth to power and you've, I think, gotten recognized for that. And congratulations on the recognition that you've gotten. It is well earned and deserved. And you've been really courageous and you've been very much, I think, authentic to who you are and always have been. I've been talking to you for years now, but obviously that you've really blown up over the past year because of your commentary, your responses, your quick wit, your use of social media but nothing more, I think it's fair to say, and there's been some pretty huge blasts for you, than your response to Marjorie Taylor Greene. You're now raising money off of bleach blonde, bad, built, butch body. And the point is, Marjorie Taylor Greene is the biggest fundraiser in the Republican House or one of the top fundraisers. And now you can be, too, to help take back the House and make Speaker Hakeem Jeffries. Is, is, is that what I'm seeing? Because you're now selling merch with this, and the money is going basically to take back the house? Is that how it works? That's absolutely how it works. Yeah. So Marjorie Taylor Greene is the fifth top fundraiser for the Republicans. Wow. Everyone that's ahead of her is a member of leadership. Those are people that are going out and talking about the importance of them maintaining control of the house, which clearly no one should want. But I do think that it is important that we recognize that this is a team sport And the blue team is so much better than the orange team. Uh, The blue team is fighting for America uh, and the orange team is fighting for the orange Jesus. And yeah, I am raising money. It helps my reelect. But more importantly, this is so that I can give money to other people, candidates that are running in really difficult seats, as well as my colleagues that are going to be fighting to maintain their very difficult seats. So I am consistently helping other people out because that's the name of the game. I can't win anything by myself. I need a strong team. And I think that America knows that there is no comparison when it comes to MAGA Mike and what will soon hopefully be Speaker Jeffries. MAGA Mike Johnson, the accountability partner's partner. Congresswoman, I want to ask you, you were just addressing the state Democratic Convention and just watched you give your speech there in Texas, Texas Democrats. Great speech. People just go watch it on YouTube like I did. You walked out, you had a big crucifix cross hanging earrings. You are the proud daughter of a minister, I think. Is that right? Yeah. And Marjorie Taylor Greene is what we now refer to, scholars refer to as Christian nationalists. We have a big, important discussion I think we have to have about the difference between your kind of Christianity and what you believe and what Christian nationalists believe, because the most pernicious and insidious belief they have is tied directly in with a history of and current feeling around white supremacy. I think it's fair to say, what is the difference between what you believe and what she believes? I don't know that she believes anything. I haven't. White supremacy seems to be the name of the game for MAGA as a whole. I will tell you that I don't think that we worship the same Jesus. My faith indicates that I should seek love and compassion. Whatever is her guiding principle is the opposite of love and compassion. She is a bully. I think that's one reason that B6 went so wild is because it was like, finally, somebody punched the bully back. 
I think that she has copied Trump, which Trump is always coming up with a way to insult someone. So she leads with insults instead of compliments. And I don't really know what she believes in besides following Trump, which is why I think that the orange Jesus um, coined phrase works out really well because they truly do worship this man. When you talk to them about policies, they can't really talk to you about policies. All they can talk about is, well, President Trump, because they call him President Trump. We need to do this for President Trump. And right. look at what they're doing for to President Trump. And this is terrible. It's all about him. The last time I checked, he only gets one vote. And depending on what law you read and what time it's going to be, he may not even get that one vote. Like, we are supposed to be beholden to the people that send us to D.C. to represent for them. And they're not. They're beholden to Trump. I feel like what you believe is is different from what the Christian right has believed for generations now in America, which is in, in these culture wars around things like women's reproductive rights, sexual orientation. You're a huge advocate, obviously, for LGBT rights, outspoken yep. in Texas, and obviously for women's reproductive rights. I just wanted to ask you, how's it going in Texas for Texas women and health care in general? It's definitely not going well at all. But we knew what would happen. I know that they were trying to get rid of the history books as soon as possible so that we would not know (laughs) what happens when women don't have access to the reproductive health that they need. Um, But we know we've seen this play out before. And so you have women that are, of course, dying. You have women that are losing their ability to bear children. You have women that are being forced to have children, even if they can't afford it or even if they have been the victims of rape. In fact, in the state of Texas, there were approximately 26,000 women that reported being impregnated due to rape in just that first year in 2023 post Dobbs. 26,000. Mm. That is, and anyone that knows anything about rape, it is very underreported. Yeah, I got to need a minute on that, that statistic. Had, that yeah, is, that, that never many, heard that. and they were impregnated is astounding. And to have people say that this is the way that uh, God wanted it and this is the faithful way to do it is absolutely ridiculous. Not to mention that we don't have an official religion in this country. That's not who we are. I know that they like to teach about the Constitution, but it seems like the only part of the Constitution that maybe they partially read was about the Second Amendment. They forget about freedom of speech when it comes to those that want to protest or freedom of press, right? They forget about things such as freedom of religion as we see the anti-Semitism, the Islamophobia. And they hate the voting parts. They hate the voting parts. You were just with your, you you were just with your sorority. I do my research. Your sorority, Mm -hmm. I think was founded at Howard. And one of the first things that sorority ever did, and I think it's like 1913 or something, was a suffrage event for voting rights. And so I feel like that is one of the, that is the main thing that constantly is under attack throughout the history of America. Women's voting rights, black voting rights, rolling back yeah. those voting rights that are hard won. And this Supreme Court, as best as anybody, is really corrupt, as you've called it, right? You yeah. just had this great no. hearing, or I guess you can't call it that because you're in the minority, but you and, and Jamie Raskin and Senator Whitehouse talking about the Supreme Court's corruption. No, yeah, we had a shadow hearing because we are in the minority. And of course, the majority doesn't want to deal with issues that the American people care about. And that's what I want people to continually think about as they debate whether or not they're going to vote or which party they're going to vote for. Think about what you've seen out of the Republican majority. We know that the Supreme Court is not a popular Supreme Court. We know that they have some of the lowest ratings that they've ever had. Yet, We're not talking about that. This is something that Congress can do something about, but this isn't what the Republicans want to do anything about. So instead, they want to have hearings on Merrick Garland and whether or not Merrick Garland should be held in contempt for holding back on an audio recording, because that's what the American people care about is this audio recording on the president who gave a voluntary interview and they actually have the written transcripts of. That's what the American people care about. It's not. The American people hate this Supreme Court. The American people who don't have to be trained lawyers to be able to know and yep. see that there is a problem with the fact that we have a Supreme Court justice that is taking in 
what we know of so far to be $4 million worth of gifts that have never been reported, right? So the issues that people care about, like how many hearings are we having about, I know the a lot of people probably didn't tune in for the 13 hour hearing or markup that we had on the farm bill where Republicans were justifying child labor and the violation of child labor laws. And it's okay. Depending on how much money it's going to cost us, we should still continue to do business with people that violate those laws or violate immigration laws. And those that, you know, or the fact that they don't care about the fact or, or the fact that they are actually wanting to cut $30 billion worth of SNAP benefits when people only get $6 a day to eat. These are not people that care about the cost of food. These are not people that are trying to do better by you and make sure that those costs are coming down. These are people that are pandering and playing to the big corporate interest. Where are you on the record on child labor? (laughs) Yeah. So needless to say, yeah, federal law makes it clear that it's against the law. And so I stand with that. It's weird because they still tout the party of law and order, but it seems like the only party that believes in law and or order is the Democratic Party at this point. I'll let you go, but I got to ask you before I do, uh, I know you just mentioned you were at a Juneteenth event. What is this holiday? It's this week, obviously. Is it Wednesday, the 19th, right? Yeah. What does Juneteenth mean to you? Juneteenth is an opportunity for us to reflect on the fact that it took an additional two years before slaves were informed down in Galveston, Texas, that they had been freed. But my question is, are we really free in this country nowadays? And will we remain free if you believe that we currently are? And I think that we should not only take this time to be in community with our loved ones and our friends and our neighbors, but we should also take this time to say, what am I going to do to preserve freedom? Because it truly has to be fought for in every generation And right now we are in for one of the biggest fights of our generation as it relates to our freedom, whether it's reproductive, whether it's for the LGBTQIA community, whether it's for civil rights, whether it's for voting rights, we are in that fight and it's going to take all of us. And so I want people to have that reflection time during this celebration. Yeah. When you think about Juneteenth, uh, think about what you can do in the next couple of months, which you're out there leading. I know how exhausted it must be, how exhaust, how much demand there is on your time and for you to perform. And you're just, we talk about you all the time. The whole, we all, you're leading and we are inspired by you. And I would follow you anywhere. I'm so, so grateful for the work that you're doing and you've really proven how much of a leader that you are. And I can't wait to watch you keep going. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Have a good one. All right, there she goes, Congresswoman Jasmine Crockett. So great. Please let her know that you heard her on the show. That would be a huge favor to me and ensure more likely that she'll come back, knowing that there's so many of you out there listening and caring about what she has to say. All right, well, now it's time to get to my second guest. I haven't had two guests on a show in a real long time. Hard to believe that I did it every day for years. But Sam Youngman is so good. He's a veteran political campaign reporter, a former White House correspondent, covered presidential campaigns in 04, 08, and 12. He's now a professor out in, on the West Coast, as well as a writer over at LA Magazine, writer at, and editor. You should subscribe to his daily newsletter that he co-writes with Adam Parkomenko. It is my fra- favorite. It's called Today's Big Stuff, todaysbigstuff.com. Caught up with Sam about a whole bunch of stuff yesterday. Brilliant and hilarious, as always. Say hi to him on all social media. Links in the show notes. Let's do it right now with the always great Sam Youngman. There he is. The people, they love him. They love when Sam Youngman comes on. He's smart. The people. The people. The people. Yes. Listen, the people, they listen. They love Sam Youngman. I don't know what to tell you. They do. Many, many, many people are saying, and by that you mean my, my sister and my nieces and nephews. I'm yes. Sure. Yes. Just your direct family members that listen to my yes. show. And contact me directly and say thank you for putting the light on Sam. Yes, that's that's exactly right. Well, everybody loves you. Everybody loves you. you. You're quickly rising as uh, someone people love to hear from because you're so good at distilling what's happening in the world and often with jokes. Not necessary, but whenever you <laughs> whatever you do, it's always great. And so let's go back to uh, to last week when the disgraced former guy. Uh, came back, he made his return. Everybody's saying he returned to the scene of the crime. First time he was back in Washington since the insurrection. And he had, they, they wished him a happy birthday. He went to the house. They welcomed him. A whole bunch of insurrectionists, uh, election deniers. They welcomed, they gave him a cake, Sam. And then he went over to the Senate and Mitch McConnell, uh, whose wife he insulted and said racist things about, shook his hand. 
Yeah, think? not a lot of self-respect on Capitol Hill these days. I mean, I don't know. On the one hand, I was disgusted to see him there. On the other hand, I was really grateful he didn't smear his own shit on the walls of the Capitol and <laughs> assault any police officers. So, right. you know, silver, silver linings, I guess. But, I mean, I think what's funny about McConnell is I covered McConnell's reelection in 2014. Oh, Kentucky and, you know, he was Yeah, and he was basically like— yeah, he was like the godfather. Like Republicans were scared to death of him. Mm. And now he's like more pathetic than Lindsey Graham's shadow. I mean, he's like Marco <laughs> Rubio, he's like Marco Rubio, but without like without the studliness, right? I mean, it's just the most pathetic man in the history of Republican politics. Like, I don't know if you remember, but he wrote a book. He was so disgusted by Barack Obama's arrogance, as he put it. Uh, I think we know what he all what he, what he actually wanted to say. But he wrote a book, a memoir that he called the the long game. And basically it was just like the whole thing was, you know, you really got to put in the time and the experience to be worthy of being a statesman. And it's like, okay, well now we see how McConnell's long game is ending with him pathetically on his knees, kissing the orange ass of the man who has ruined his life, insulted his wife, and basically just made him a very unhappy tortoise. And, you know, it's such a great audiogram you just made for me. But also, <laughs> he, like others, could have punched out at a certain point, and history would have not seen them as pathetic and ruined. Rudy Giuliani would be another example if he oh, hadn't linked on. up with Trump and he, before that, obviously. I mean, black and brown people always hated him in New York sure. when he was mayor and, and, and so on, if you listen to them. But then Mitch McConnell, he could have punched out too, but now he's this feeble – a guy who, you know, has these uh, senior moments where he freezes up. And as you just said, all those other things having to be uh, prostrate to the worst guy in the world, Donald Trump. I mean, it's one of the very few things I think we should be grateful to Trump for is he reveals these people for who they really yeah. are, whether it's, yeah. you know, whether it's Giuliani, you know, yeah. who was always this person whether it's McConnell, who was always this person, or whether it's, you know, the racist D-bag from high school on Facebook who you thought was a pretty cool guy until he got his red hat. You know, <clears throat> the thing is, Trump has given these people permission to be who they really are, and we don't have to guess anymore. We know. We don't have to buy the lies that we were told for many years. They're, they're owning who and what they really are. I'm just really scared about how many of them there are. Yeah, that's a really great point. I mean, um, speaking of which others, we know specifically J.D. Vance and Marco Rubio, who are both vice presidential potentials. And both these guys savaged Donald Trump. Rubio ran against him. Donald Trump said he had a small dick, if I remember. I mean, like, or something like they talked about their dicks on a debate stage. Like these guys are now potential VPs. Uh, I don't know what I mean, is to Trump, add that hasn't been said Trump about them. J.D. sat on a stage with Trump and Trump said, quote, J.D. can't stop kissing my ass. And that man is telling us every day about masculinity. Yeah. He's telling us about love of country. You know, I the lack of dignity, the lack of self-respect, the lack of just, I don't know. Being able to stand up for yourself, I just I thought these were supposed to be tough guys and they're all wimps. Yeah, and there's nothing weaker than a guy who uh, lets his spouse be attacked and then goes and is kind. I mean, like, <laughs> well, I mean, how are they going to stand up for your family if they won't stand up for their own? That's a great question. Yeah, great question. Great point. Uh, what do you think about all these kind of edited or not edited, you know, interesting angled tapes of, of Joe Biden from the one in France uh, to the one at the event that you were actually at the other night in Hollywood? I want to ask you about that. You're a very big deal, Sam Youngman. But. Uh, these, these, these old, these tapes that make Joe Biden look old. And I think they're played like I was watching one of these Fox news watchdogs today, like 30 times today, just Biden wandering somewhere or another, which you could make that tape by any one of us, I suppose. But I mean, like, what are they, they're just perpetuating the he's old thing that's working for them, I guess. Yeah. I mean, Joe Biden is old and, uh, and Joe Biden is also the greatest jobs president of my lifetime. Um, <clears throat> You know, Trump had a birthday on Friday. He turned 78. And uh, I don't know. I mean, I get what they're doing because it's all they've got. I mean, you're not going to run against the economy because right now the economy is the envy of the world. Um, you can't run saying you want to restore decency to the White House because it sure as hell wasn't there when Trump was in office. You can't run saying, hey, remember January 6th because they don't want us to remember what happened on January 6th. And so they go after the only thing they can go after 
which, you know, fortunately for them is what the New York Times is going after, too, which is Joe Biden is old. He is. And, you know, the question I think comes down to is, is old a bad thing? You know, is experience a bad thing? Looking at the policy results Joe Biden has achieved in the last three years, I'll take that kind of old. Yeah, well, that's for damn sure. His record is unquestionably excellent uh, in our lifetime. But I guess it doesn't matter. I mean, you know, we found out these FBI statistics. I think you covered it in, a, uh, in the newsletter, of course, uh, this week. Violence has gone way down across the country by so many different metrics. But it doesn't matter. Like you have these statistics, but they don't it doesn't matter. They're still going to say and Trump is going to say that, you know, Milwaukee's a shithole and any other city that has violence right. and so on. And they, and they perpetuated that uh, over and over on the Sunday show. So the truth of the statistics don't necessarily matter about trends. No, it's pretty remarkable. You've heard me say before, I covered three and a quarter presidential campaigns, the quarter being Rand Paul's short-lived run. And there was never a campaign I covered where this unemployment rate would have been no big deal. There was never a campaign I covered where these monthly job reports would have been no big deal. And there was sure as hell never a campaign I covered where one of the candidates being called a rapist by the judge would have been no big deal. So by every metric we've ever used in presidential campaigns, Joe Biden is doing great. But for whatever reason, our friends in the mainstream media have thrown out those metrics and they've adopted new ones, uh, like the New York Times deciding that Donald Trump isn't actually that old because he dances and puts off energy. Uh, So, yeah, it's all vibes. It's not facts. And you see it. You see it in an American public who thinks we're in a recession, who don't realize that we're actually the envy of, you know, the G7 countries. It's uh, if I was a mainstream reporter these days. I'd be pretty damn ashamed at how uninformed the public are, and uh, I would feel like I had failed at my job. Well, I feel like so many people are getting their news from places that aren't, quote, mainstream reporters and like places like TikTok videos of just here's here's Joe Biden wandering off. And it's like I'm over here doing my job as a political reporter, but nobody's even reading it because they're watching goddamn TikTok videos. I mean, I was trying to talk to my daughters about it. They're not a, the most engaged in day to day you know, news, uh, but still they, they don't, you know, they don't. They don't get this stuff. A lot of people just don't get this stuff. It's so frustrating as to how we're supposed to get evidence and arguments out to people if they're not paying attention to, quote, mainstream reporters or anybody else. That's why they should just at least read your daily email and newsletter exactly. and listen That's to my exactly right. daily show. And then you'd know a lot more. You'd know that Sam was in L.A. at a record breaking fundraiser. I don't know if it's record breaking, but they raised like 30 million dollars. Biden and Obama Julia Roberts and uh, George Clooney and Jack Black and uh, who who else was there? And Barbara what was Streisand, man? Streisand was there, and yeah. the, the the Jill Biden, I think, was on. Yeah. I mean, was Jimmy, it a Jimmy Kimmel? It was Kimmel. Uh, it was a great event. Um, yeah, I attended. Um, it was uh, Saturday night in downtown L.A. at the at uh, the Peacock Theater, right there by uh, what used to be known as the Staples Center. Uh, it was great. It was. I mean, you know, anytime you get that group of people together in the same room, you're going to have a good time. Um, but, you know, I think what was interesting is, aside from the good vibes, aside from the laughter, there were just, a, you know, a serious undertone throughout the whole evening of, seriously, y'all, we've been warned about what's coming, and if we don't do something to stop it, we're in big, big trouble. Um, you heard Joe Biden talk about the Supreme Court Saturday night in ways I hadn't heard him talk about before. He said it was, quote, one of the scariest things about the possibility of a second Trump, Trump administration. Um you know, and and Jack Black was just great. He was wearing, quote, kick ass American flag overalls. And uh, he said, you know, when Joe Biden needs me to step up for democracy, I answer the call. And uh, so I'm hoping we've all got a little Jack Black in us. So it was like a, just like a bunch of people went on stage and just spoke. Is Was there any kind of performance of any sort? Yeah. Yeah, in fact, I would describe it almost like a mini DNC. Like, that's what it felt like. Um, there were performers. I, I thought it was funny. Uh, there, there were performers. There were two women who, uh, Sister Strings was their name. One played cello, one played violin, and they did a, a beautiful uh, rendition of um, Lift Up Every Voice and Sing. And then Cheryl Lee Ralph, uh, I'm sure you know from Abbott Elementary and other, other shows, um, she just tore the roof off with God Bless America. Um, so, yeah, no, it, it really did. It felt what I was going to say was a lot of the performers, you know, you're in L.A., so there's no shortage of music, musicians and acts around here. But they actually imported uh, the like the sister strings from uh, Milwaukee. 
And then another group came from Colorado. So I like that they're thinking about swing states at all times, even when they're in L.A. Uh, good. It seems like the campaign, I don't know if the campaign is doing a good job or not. It seems like such a hard thing to navigate and every day they're reacting to things, but they certainly are cutting ads really quick. The Biden Harris campaign and putting out some powerful ads. And, and I, I think they're pretty organized, certainly in those swing states, but man, it does feel like it's going to be close. Uh, let's just see what, you know, meanwhile, Trump was out there on the campaign trail. He was in Detroit. He went to a quote, black church filled with white people. It would seem And then he went to an event for Turning Point USA, the uh, far right extreme super racist organization. And and, and they had like a banner there called White Boy Summer. And I think Trump was on stage in around that. I mean, it was quite a disparity. But, you know, some of these polling and and things we're seeing with certain uh, statistics of black folks maybe moving away from Biden or towards Trump. It's so hard to believe. I talked with Congressman Jasmine Crockett about it this morning. She's like, listen, I haven't seen it. Uh, but it is scary. And uh, I wonder what you saw with the president visiting Detroit and trashing Milwaukee and every other black, well-known black city in, a, in the country. Yeah, I mean, that's the thing, right? I mean, he trashes people and then turns around and expects their support. And I think one reason he does it is because it's worked in the past. I mean, yeah. Remember, this is the same asshole who told Ohio to boycott Goodyear and Ohio still voted for him. So, I mean, I think he feels like he can, you know, be as racist as he wanted, wants to be on one, you know, in one event and then turn around and ask for black support at the next. Um, you know, I, I don't know that I buy it either, but I'm glad that the, that the Biden campaign isn't taking it for granted. I'm glad that they're making sure black supporters know how appreciated they are. I'm glad that they're talking about the number of black judicial appointments the president's made. I'm glad they're talking about record low black unemployment. Uh, because so much of what Trump's appeal is to black voters, if you can call it an appeal, it's just based on bullshit. It's, you know, <laughs> you, remember, you remember when he signed the Juneteenth proclamation? He was like, nobody's ever heard of Juneteenth before me. It's like, yeah, dude, we knew. We knew. He, yeah. And so, I, I, you know, didn't he talk I, about Frederick Douglass in the, in the present tense? <laughs> yeah, that many people are starting to hear about this Frederick Douglass. And I, I don't remember what the exact quote You just said is, Frederick yeah. Douglass is a good guy. <laughs> Yeah. Well, I mean, that's the he gives himself away, right? Like you can tell, okay, yeah. never heard of Frederick Douglass yeah. until he was reading the tele- teleprompter that day. Um, so, yeah, look, I don't know how much of this is smoke and mirrors. I don't know how much of this is, you know, a lot of times when we hear white politicians, so they want to reach out to black voters. What they're really doing is trying to reach out to white moderates and not look like racist assholes. Um, so maybe that's the play here. I don't know. But I do think it is inherently racist to say, hey, I'm a convicted felon now, so black people will love me. It's like, yeah, dude, most black people are not convicted felons, and it's pretty fucked up to think that they are. Yeah, yeah. You've got like two rappers that said something, and that gets over ma- ridiculous amounts of coverage. And you've got too many, you know, black folks who shouldn't be being listened to, in my opinion. This guy Charlemagne the God is one of them. And they get an undue amount of attention, and they say shit that gets – I think misrepresented a lot of other black folks I talked to are like, what is he talking about that? He does yeah. not speak for me. And, and so it, it, I just think that media jumps all over some of these people and uh, somehow makes us feel like they're overrepresenting for one. I mean, that's how you get, you know, months of stories about the coming red wave, right? Is you take this anecdotal bullshit and you blow it up into something it's not. And yeah, I mean, yeah, anyway, I'll, I'll stop there, but yes, I agree. Uh, we, the debates are in like 10 days or something from when we're talking. That's crazy. And I mean, A, I don't want to speculate too much. Maybe it doesn't happen, Sam. I mean, the odds of it happens, but I just do. I think the rules are so in Joe Biden's favor. There's no audience and your mic gets turned off. I, I think that's going to be really good for, for Joe Biden, but we're going to find out who's got the most energy, who makes the most senior, has the most senior moments on that night. Yeah. It It would seem right. Yeah, I tend to agree. Um, you know, as for the cutting the mics thing, I, I go back and forth. I mean, yeah, I want Joe Biden to be able to concentrate on his answers. But at the same time, I feel like the more pe- the American people hear Donald Trump talk, the better off we're going to be. Um, I do think there is a lot of amnesia around just how bad of a president yeah. and human being he yeah. was or uh, is. And uh, so, I mean, you know, that, for me, there's something to be said for letting that son of a bitch ramble and just make a complete ass out of himself. Um, but yeah, no, I'm glad that Biden will have the the time and space to make his case um, and to, you know, share with the American people what he's accomplished in the last three and a half years, because it's a it's a lot and it just hasn't broken through. 
Yeah. I mean, uh, I just can't, I just can't. Uh, what are you doing that night? Maybe I, I should host a party. <laughs> Yeah. I don't know. That sounds like a good time. I, I imagine I'll be sitting in the dark. You no, know, we do debate. Chewing, where I've hosted my fingernails and I hosted debate parties uh, for years when I was at Sirius XM and I think even CNN. I did some stuff around that. And I used to go to the debates. Like I get real into them, and I, I, I just I cannot watch them alone. I have to be with the group, and so I'll definitely be hosting something here. So you are absolutely invited if you don't have anything uh, more important to do with LA Magazine and all of your other important gigs. But, and that sounds awesome. It's yeah. a very kind invite. Yeah, yeah. We'd love to see you. Um, why don't you like Merrick Garland? What? Did Merrick tell you that? Um, honestly, <laughs> no, fuck I'm Merrick. I don't like Merrick Garland for one very simple reason. Uh, Donald Trump isn't in jail, and he should be. And I realize that that's a simplistic and reductive way at looking at what the AG has done. Um, <clears throat> but there are just too many instances where I feel like he's been soft when he yeah. should have been aggressive. And I think maybe um, – Another more aggressive pick uh, would have been my choice. Um, but, yeah, I don't know. It's not that I don't like Merrick, I guess. I just have a hard time defending him. Sort of like just, Dick Durbin. I, I was, <laughs> same with Dick Durbin. You said, yeah. Yeah. Because he's not moving and doing anything about holding Supreme Court Justice uh, Clarence Thomas responsible for his corruption. Yeah. I mean, there's that. There's the Alito flag flying bullshit. I mean, you know, look, I get it. You don't have the votes to do some of the things you want to do, but you know if Washington only moved when they had the votes, then nothing, no, nobody would ever do anything. You look at what the House has done, what the lunatics in the House Republican Caucus have done. They're passing shit that isn't going to ever see the light of day, but they're, and they're holding hearings that are never going to result in any kind of serious criminal prosecution. But they're drawing attention. They're getting headlines. They're you know they're muddying the water in ways they want to. You're telling me you can't get. Sam Alito's neighbors to come testify from the Senate Judiciary and everybody wouldn't be riveted by what they have to say. I just to me, it looks like Durbin has laid down and surrendered over and over and over again in what is a very crucial role, chairman of Senate Judiciary Committee. And, you know, the thing is, sometimes people don't need results. Sometimes people need performative outrage so they know that you get it. And I think a lot of Democrats feel like he doesn't get it. Yeah, I saw that that hearing that uh, Sheldon Whitehouse worked with uh, AOC, Jasmine Crockett, Jamie Raskin on. It was like outside the House. It wasn't official, but it hit social media. It was something it, it meant. It, like, what else are you doing? Yeah, that's exactly it. But not only that, if you want the New York Times to keep talking about it, then you got to give them something to talk about. Right. Because we've learned they're not going to do it on their own. And so, you know, the way you keep the story going, the way you set the narrative, the way you put your opponents on defense is you keep the heat up. And for whatever reason, and, you know, I don't know if it's because we have vulnerable members in the Senate, we're trying desperately to hold on, but it just, for whatever reason, has just not materialized. I love talking to you, man. I love getting your take on all of this stuff. I appreciate you joining me. I hope everybody reads uh, today's big stuff, subscribes now to the podcast. What else do we want to plug? Come read us at LAMag.com. We're doing all kinds of stuff out here. Yeah, you're pumping out a lot of stuff over there that I didn't even get to. I was so focused on today's big stuff. But LAMag.com, everybody, and go find Sam right now where everywhere that he lives, which is all linked in the show notes. Thank you. Get surfing. Pete, you're the best, man. Thanks so much for having me. All right, there you go, Sam Youngman. Get, say hello to him. Subscribe to Today's Big Stuff in L.A. Magazine. And I always appreciate when you reach out to the guests and help promote the show. So many of you do that each and every day, and I can't do it without you and your support. Patreon.com slash Pete Dominic. You bumblebees listened all the way to the end. Oh, man, should have done a longer show. I, I didn't even do the sound clips, but under an hour today. So I hope you uh, liked it. Thanks to Jasmine Crockett. Sam Youngman, great to get two guests back on the show and looking forward to putting out a whole bunch more this week. And uh, I love you. I appreciate you. And I hope that you are doing okay. John Carroll taking us out as he does every day right now. See the forest full of burning trees you got to stand up. Hey, you've been sitting so long, you got the creep kidneys, you got to stand up. Stand up. I think you're driving wheels in a leaking grease. Boy, you better stand up, stand up. Well, there's a whole lot more of us who know us right. They'll keep right on ignoring us if we keep in tight. You got to open up the window to let in some light. You got to stand up. That's right. We got to rise up. You got to stand up. You got to stare the devil straight in the eye. We got to let him know it's his turn to go. Off of your foot, down off of your 
off on your fence. Yeah, even if it ain't a very friendly audience, well, they'll begin to listen when you start making sense and you stand up. Stand our ground and then stand up, stand up. Well, the founding fathers saw a land for all. They had to stand up, they had to stand up. They had a keen imagination for a crystal ball, drawing all the plans of a stand up. But all they had to go on was the time they were in with other causes for laws. And since they weren't even sin, they knew that change was going to come before the change would begin. They had to stand up. All right, they had to stand up. We got to stand up. We got to look the devil square in the eye. We got to let him know it's his time to go and make it clear when all we hear is a lie. See him flee the scene of that experiment If you stand up stand All right, up. we got to speak up We got to reach up And raise your voice in every way you know how Don't be told us up You got to show up Ain't no better time to do it but now No need to pledge allegiance to no ones and try to rise up Show a beatings to the voice inside And listen well and it'll tell you not to run and hide It says stand up Stand oh, up Oh, got to stand